welcome to WSSB Girl TV, where strong, smart, and bold. Today we bring you interviews with women leading workshops at Celebrate Wellness Fest, benefiting girls in. For information on this wonderful event, visit www.celebratewellnessfest.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Today's focus is the recipe for shepherd's pie. First comes the meat. We use ground turkey here at Girls Inc. because it's lower in fat and healthier than ground beef. Because you mix the meat with other ingredients, the turkey tastes just as good as the beef. In a large skillet over medium high heat, heat the oil then add the meat and garlic and cook for 8 to 10 minutes until the meat is brown. Be sure to do this with your parent's permission or do it with your parent. You can also make the meat in the microwave. After the meat is cooked, drain the fat and add soup mix, mushroom soup, and beef broth. Reduce the heat and simmer for about five minutes until it thickens. Be sure to give it an occasional stir, then pour your mixture into your baking dish. Next, you'll sprinkle on some corn or some peas. The recipe says you can use peas, which is the traditional way to do it, but you can use whichever you like best. Then you'll add the mashed potatoes. You can make them from scratch, which is in our recipe. You can also buy them frozen if you are in a hurry, but it will cost you more. Use a spatula to spread the potatoes over the corn. You can also use the back of a spoon or a knife, but be sure to get have your parents' permission to use a knife. Next, you can add some decorations to your mashed potatoes. The crisscross pattern we used is the traditional way to do it, but this is your chance to show your creativity. Next, cover your pan with foil and put your shepherd's pie in a 350 degree oven for 30 minutes. Then, take it out and remove the foil. Put it back in the oven for 15 more minutes. Then, take it out and sprinkle on some of your favorite shredded cheddar cheese. After that, put the shepherd's pie back in the oven until the cheese melts. When you feel the cheese has melted to your satisfaction, take it out of the oven and voila, you have your shepherd's pie. For a complete copy of today's recipe, visit the Girls Only section of our website and click on What's New. Hi, my name is Letty, and today I am here with Dr. Dr. Jessica Lipham, and she will tell us about her job. Did you ever dream of wanting to be a doctor when you were little? Why, yes, I did. I always knew that I wanted to help people feel better from a very young age. Partly because my mother is a nurse, so I always had that around me in my family. Um, secondly, because there was something in me very early that filled me up inside when I was able to help people, or animals even. So rescuing a little bird even would be a good example of something that I remember in third grade doing and feeling really good about it because I was able to help it. So yeah. I always knew I wanted to help people. What kind of doctor are you? Thank you for asking. I am a doctor of naturopathic medicine as well as a doctor of oriental medicine. So I have two different degrees that allow me to uh, offer people a very well-rounded um, frame for their health and well-being. Okay. What kinds of medicine do you give to people? I give people all kinds of different medicines. Sometimes my words can be medicine for people. I use Chinese herbs. I use Western botanicals, things that are simple that you might even find in your garden, like parsley or chives or onions and garlic. So food also is good medicine. I use something called tinctures, which is herbs preserved in alcohol. And then it's in a liquid form, and you would just take it by dropper in the mouth. And then I also use homeopathic remedies, which are very easy to use and take. Um, lots of different nutraceuticals, supplements and things. I'll make sure that I uh, use my eagle eye vision and make sure people are, are using quality supplements. And if not, then I like to go shopping for them and make sure that they're getting everything that they're paying for. 
Why do you work with herbs? I love working with herbs because that is earth's natural medicine, right? If it grows from the earth, doesn't it make you think in one way or another it would be helpful for us? Like all the food in your garden, very delicious. So herbs um, for people translates like food. So food being our primary medicine and herbs being the secondary in that the body absorbs the herbal remedies just as if it was having a nice salad or a nice meal. So I happen to have um, I think I have the largest Chinese herbal medicinary in this area and, and my preference is to uh, make formulas for people that are specific for them and what's going on. And people usually enjoy being part of their medicine because I give them a bag and they go home and then they make a big batch of tea that they can drink. How do you support an entire family at once with their health? You must have seen that on my website. Yes. Okay. So oftentimes a member of the family will come in for, um, say it's a four-year-old who's coming in with a cold. And I get a chance to know either the mom or the dad or both who, who brought the child in. And it just happens to spiral out into the entire family because usually that's not the only person that's not feeling well, right? And so commonly, I'll start off with one member of a family, and it literally spirals out to those in your immediate family, and then maybe aunts and uncles and grandmas. I have two families right now that I have four generations that come see me pretty regularly, and that's a really cool thing. So great-grandma down to great-grandbaby. Yeah. How do you raise a baby and be a doctor at the same time? That's challenging. However, it, it can be done. I, I don't have my baby with me at work any longer. She's 18 months and I have a four and a half year old boy. But after I had her, I actually wrapped her to me and I brought her to work for the first three months so she got to be right with me. Um, I think the best way for me to answer that question would be uh, to have patience with myself and to have patience with my family and my patient and patience with my patients but balance is the key right you can't be tipped one way too far one way because then the family my family might miss out if I give too much at work same thing if I give too much at my house to my family then I don't have a lot to give to my patients so uh, this year specifically I made a pact with myself to be in more uh, of an even balance so that everybody gets enough attention. Your New Year's revolution. It, it, it definitely <clears throat> was and is. I think about it every day. What part do you like best about being a doctor? Oh, there's so many pieces to it. Um, I, I love helping people, of course, helping people feel better. If, if, uh, I was, if I was doing what I'm doing and people weren't feeling better, then I would say I wasn't doing a good job, and that wouldn't make or help me to feel better either. I enjoy learning about people and their stories, and I would say that probably at this point is my favorite thing, is just really getting to hear people's stories and know how varied and different we all are, even though we really are all the same. Could you tell us how we could contact you and learn more? Sure. I have a website. It's sarasotahealingarts.com. And uh, I recently have a partner now, and so my uh, office has a second website, which is thrivesarasota.com. And on both of those websites, I have my email and my phone number to contact me at any time with questions. You can send me an email or even a text. I do that too. So feel free if you have any questions. Okay. Hi. This has been Leticia. Bye.
Hi, my name is Leticia Lopez. Today I will tell you the story of the Little Rock Nine. In 1957, nine African American students at Little Rock Central High School were banned from school. The law said African Americans were allowed to go to white schools, but the police and the governor of Arkansas said no. I don't think that was fair. But thanks to President Eisenhower, the students were allowed to go to school and were protected. They were heroes for being brave and standing up for their rights. This has been Leticia talking to you with the Little Rock Nine Heroes. Bye. Hi, and welcome to Girl TV. Peyton here. And Helena here. Today we are going to spend a day with the lovebird. Lovebirds lay about three to six eggs each time they lay a group of eggs, so they might even have a few siblings. There are nine different kinds of lovebirds, and eight of them live in Africa right now. The peach-faced lovebird is the most popular lovebird in the whole country. With the lovebird's beak, they can eat a variety of different kinds of seeds, nuts, or fruits, like sunflower seeds. You might even eat sunflower seeds! Lovebirds usually live in the dry, open country. Most of the time, lovebirds weigh less than a quarter of a pound. Such a tiny light bird. They are very energetic, curious, and very interesting. Maybe we can go and see one in real life. Yeah, maybe we could adopt one or even take a field trip to visit one. Well, time for us to fly away. Do we really have to? Yes, yes we do. For Girl TV, I'm Helena. And I'm Peyton. Bye! Do you like to find new clues? Hi, my name is Hunter. Today I'll tell you the career of the week. The career of the week is a detective. A detective interrogates people, places, and things to determine the details of a crime. The dictionary says interrogate means to ask questions to seek the answers. In most cases, people are referring to, a pri to private investigators. A private investigator is not a police officer, but many of them are retired police officers. They are not always on the job to discover crime. However, if a private investigator can prove that a crime has happened, he or she can let the person be arrested. Do you know about Nancy Drew? Nancy Drew is a fictional young adult who can't help but solve these mysteries. Besides blue, Nancy Drew's car has been yellow, green, and even maroon. In the early books, Nancy often wore glamorous heels and fashionable dresses while chasing suspects climbing ladders, and sleuthing for ghosts in secret passageways. Wearing heels while doing all of that, I wonder if she had blisters. Nancy never takes money for her detective work. Carolyn Keene is the author of Nancy Drew. Did you know Carolyn Keene is a ghostwriter? That means more than one person wrote the book under that name. Both men and women wrote it. The first person to write it was Edward Straitmeyer. He then passed Carolyn Keene down to his daughter Edna, Edna wrote 10 books before passing Carolyn Keene down to her sister, Harriet. Harriet wrote 24 of the books. There are many more ghostwriters of Nancy Drew, but it would take too long to tell you. Now you know what a detective is. That's all for today. Wait, what's that noise? I wonder if it's a ghost. Bye. Hi, my name is Genesis. I'm with Kimberly Braun. She is a minister, a meditation coach, workshop facilitator, and creator of Celebrate Wellness Fest. Why did you choose to be a nun? <laughs> well, that's an excellent question too. I get that question a lot. Do I look like somebody that was a nun? <laughs> no, because I'm wearing normal clothes and my hair is long and I do a lot of fun, crazy things. I like to dance and laugh and I'm not the picture of what somebody thinks a nun is like. But nuns are really very joyful, just like I am. And when I was young, when I was about 18, I started working with the poor, and I was manager with some other people in a shelter where we helped them. And we'd get up at 5.30 in the morning and be in the chapel in California, and we would all be quiet. And it was a time of prayer and meditation and peacefulness that made me happy. And I also realized that when we shared that with the people we were working with, they too were happier in their lives and they seemed to do better. So after one step, after another, after another, I realized I wanted to give my life in service of the world by praying for people. 
and by being present and being as loving as I possibly could be, and I knew that would have the greatest effect. You wanted, how did you get to, how did you, how did you get to build a monastery? Did you go to school for it? <laughs> it probably would have helped had I gone to school for it. But I was a nun, and I had been a nun for five years, <laughs> and they asked me to move from North Dakota, really cold, all the way down to Texas. And when I went to Texas, there were only five of us down there, five nuns, and we were living in a house. And so we needed to have a permanent building, a place that had a church and a place that had where we could keep all our food and where each of the nuns could have their own place to sleep, where we weren't just living on top of each other. And step after step, as I worked with the prioress, who's the leader of the community, it became really clear that it was easy for me to manage a big project. In fact, the monastery is over 17,000 square feet and it's made out of stone that we collected out of the earth. And it's made with iron and wood. And it's valued over $9 million. And when I built it, I just worked with hundreds of people volunteering their time and their services. So it was a gift that I didn't know that I had. You wanted to work with people to help, to help their health, personal growth, stress level and performance ability. Why do you want to work with these people in all of these ways? I know when we were looking at that, there are four separate things, right? Their health and personal growth and stress and performance. But in my mind, they're actually all one in the same. And I talk about them differently because a lot of times when people come to me when they want to learn meditation or when they attend a workshop, where they can come to greater peace in their lives, they're thinking in their minds, oh my God, I'm stressed out. I just want to learn to manage my stress. So then I talk about things that way. Sometimes people are just not stressed out at all and they just want to grow. They just want to develop some new gift or maybe they want to be better at what they're doing. So since people come to me for different reasons, I talk about it in different ways. But ultimately, it's all the same, and that's really realizing our own empowerment from within. That's what I help with. What types of workshops do you teach? As I was kind of saying in that question, I teach a lot of different styles, but my passion is really meditation and centering techniques. My greatest gifts are helping people to move from where they're distracted or depressed or anxious and all out there. I help them kind of let all that go and go within and come to a very calm, open place. So most of my workshops teach people how to do that. I may do it by giving inspirational talks. Like maybe I'll talk about how we find joy. I may do it by helping people understand where they need to heal something in their lives. Maybe they got hurt at some time and they're still feeling angry or upset about that. I can help them kind of dissolve that pain so that they can move on as well. So it takes many different shapes but always involves some type of calming technique. Why did you create Celebrate Wellness Fest? Is it a lot of work? It is a ton of work. Have you ever put together a party? Not really. <laughs> no, you don't know how to put together. Maybe, have you helped somebody put together a party? Yes. Okay, so you, knew, you know it takes a lot of people to put together a good party. Well, a festival is a party like that times a thousand. So it's oh. a lot of work. And I started it because I work in health and wellness here in Sarasota. And when I moved here in 2005, I met a lot of amazing people working in health and wellness. And I was so inspired that I wanted everybody to know about them. And I thought, what better way would there be than to create a really big party where everybody in Sarasota and even beyond Sarasota can come and try out what these people do or talk to them or meet them or hear a talk. So I put it together so that I could grow awareness in the community. How can people learn more about the festival and about your work? I have two separate websites devoted to that. The festival is going to be in March on the 10th and the 11th. That's a Saturday and a Sunday. And the website is www.celebratewellnessfest.com. 
And to learn about my work, you can just use my name. It's www.kimberlybraun.com. You can also call my phone number. My phone number is 284-3036. And if you call that number, you can find out about both of those things all in one shot. For Girl TV, this is Genesis. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Hello, my name is Amaya. Today I want to tell you about Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was most famous for standing up for her rights to say wherever she wants on the bus. When it was 1983, Rosa Parks was in Women's Hall of Fame in Michigan. When it was 1996, Rosa Parks was presented by Bill Clinton, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This is the highest honor given to a citizen who is not in the military by the U.S. government. Rosa Parks was presented with the Peace Abbey Courage of Conscience Award. Why was she given this award? She spent many years fighting for freedom in a peaceful way. Rosa Parks, My Story was written and published in 1992 by Rosa Parks herself. The book told about the years and led up to the day she decided to stay in a, stay in a seat instead of giving it up for a white person. Later on, she made another book called Quiet Strength, which described the bravery for not giving up her seat and continuing to fight for freedom. In 1999, Rosa Parks was in an award was awarded with the Congressional Gold Medal. The decoration is awarded to an individual who performs an outstanding deed or act to, of the s service of the security, prosperity, and national interests of the United States. What I like about this is that it feels like you're going back in time to see Rosa Parks. I hope you like going back in time with me. Well, I know I did. I'm going back to where I came from. Bye. Hi, I'm Zandy. I'm here with Cheryl. Is it hard to work with students? Hi, Zandy. I'm Cheryl, and I'm the director of the Garden of the Heart Yoga Center in Sarasota. And I teach yoga there, and I love working with students. Um, sometimes it's hard because they want to do really challenging yoga poses, so we kind of have to take them apart into smaller, more manageable pieces and learn all the parts, and then we put them back together again, and it's really fun. How do you help them with hard poses? We do the hard poses in little parts. We take them apart and we do them easier ways and different variations. Sometimes we use props like a block or a belt or a blanket to make it easier. Why would you call your center Garden of the Heart? Well, a garden is a place that you have to take care of and it's full of many beautiful things. And so the Garden of the Heart Yoga Center is the place where people come and they take care of themselves. They get strong and flexible and they learn how to relax and calm themselves down. And we remember that everyone there is like a beautiful, unique flower in a garden. And it's fun. You said that five things happen in every class. Heart-centered theme, philosophy, pranayama, manual adjustments, and deep relaxation. What do these words mean? That's a lot of words, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, a heart-centered theme is like an idea that we talk about during each class, and that might be celebration or mindfulness or something like just um, fun. Sometimes we just the theme of the class is fun, and it's something that you can feel in your heart. So as you're doing your yoga stretch, we remind you like to feel the celebration in your heart and let it shine out. Um, the next word you mentioned was philosophy. And yoga comes from a tradition in India, so sometimes during the class we'll tell stories, like mytholog mythological stories about Indian gods and goddesses and things. And it also is a way to remember that we're all part of the universe and we're all connected. Pranayama means um, techniques of using your breath. So sometimes um, you can use the breath in an active way to get energized in your body, or sometimes we'll use the breath in a more quieting way so that you can relax and de-stress. Um, manual adjustments we do in every class where the teacher will come around to all of the students and like just kind of help them move into the pose maybe a little bit deeper or help them back off into a more manageable version of the pose. And then at the end of each class, we always do a deep relaxation. So everyone will lie down on the floor 
and the yoga teacher will instruct to relax all the muscles in your body and you just get a, a really nice way to feel refreshed and revitalized at the end of the class. What made you first sign up for a yoga class? Well, I started taking yoga classes after I left a position as a martial arts teacher. So it was another way to strengthen my body and stretch and feel good. And um, right after that first class, I just, I loved it so much. I just wanted to keep going back and back and back. And what motivated you to become a teacher? Um, well, I had already been a teacher working with, um, you know, the martial arts group. And so it was, it just felt natural. It felt like this was something I really wanted to do. And I really enjoyed the yoga. And I knew right away that I wanted to teach. What are the qualities you bring to being director of the center? I think the most important quality is a, a sense of welcoming. Um, when people come in, I like to make everyone feel like they're part of the family there. Um, another one is patience. Another one is organization. It takes a lot of work to run a center. So I find myself doing lots of different things every day, and I really enjoy that. How do you teach yoga, take care of your family? run your own center and play tabla at the same time? It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of different things to balance. And um, the, the first thing to go when I find I'm really busy is, you know, the, the playing the drums has to sort of take a side burner. Um, the most important thing, of course, is I always try to make time for my family, even if I'm really busy. Um, they're really supportive. I love having lots of stuff to do. It keeps me busy. And um, it's, yeah. <laughs> does it give you courage to do all these things? It does. And I find that whenever I'm teaching, I have to tap into that courage that I know is already in my heart so that I can stand up in front of a group of people and, you know, help them to find something that, that they love to do also. Tell us how people can find out more about you and your center. Well, if you're interested in finding out more about yoga, the best thing is to look at our website, which is gardenoftheheartyoga.com, and there you'll find our uh, weekly schedule of classes and descriptions of all the classes that we offer there. For Girl TV, I'm Zandi. Bye.